Uh, all right, I think uh, we can start today's seminar. So uh, before uh, this, let's uh, Dr. Xi jumps uh, do that first. We just do a brief uh, introduction to both our center and also uh, the bio of Dr. Xi as well. So uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please uh, just post those stuff in the chat or raise your hand. The presentation, we can just uh, uh, let the, the guest uh, presenter to answer your questions. And uh, today, uh, the seminar topic is towards robust autonomous driving system by Dr. C. Jun. We will also call him Jax. So let me do a brief uh, introduction for him. Dr. C. Jun just uh, received the PhD in software engineering from the University of Texas at Austin in 2015. From 2005 to 2002, he was the chief solution architect for Manual of Australia. He is currently the director of Inten uh, Intelligent Systems Research Group, director of the international engagement in the School of Computing, senior lecturer and the deputy program leader in software engineering at Macquarie University, Australia. His research interests include cyber physical systems testing and verification, safety analysis, distributed learning, Internet of Things, and software engineering in general. He has acquired more than 1.2 million competitive funding in ARC and Data61 projects on safety analysis, modeling testing and verification, and trustworthy AI on autonomous vehicles. He also won a few awards, including leading industry researcher and the MQ Macquarie early career researcher. He has a number of highly cited papers and best conference papers. He served as yeah. first for software yeah. system flagship, uh, flagship conferences, including the papers uh, we mentioned before, and also like his uh, as a PC for the FSE 2022 to 2024 and the PROCOM 2017 to 2024 as well. He also served as a PC chair of a number of good, great uh, conferences, including IEEE CPSCOM, IEEE Broadnet and also associate editor for ACM Distributed Ledger Technologies. So let's uh, do the acknowledgement of the country first. Uh, we acknowledge the people of the Wai War and the Bon War language groups of the Eastern Coordination on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of RMIT University and the lands that I'm speaking from today. We respectfully acknowledge the First Nations people of the Five Kuli Nations their ancestors and elders, past, present, and emerging. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. So before we start, we also do a brief introduction for our center, Center for Cyber Security Research and Innovation. This is a multidisciplinary research center that brings researchers from across RMIT to bring a true multidisciplinary approach to the organizational, human, and the technology aspects of cybersecurity. And we also encourage your uh, HR, HDR students like PhD and the Master by Research and the Honor students to join the Cyber Club. If you, uh, your student is interested in, please email to ccsri at rmit.edu.au. So this is all the presentation from um, my side, and let's give a uh, welcome our presenter, Dr. James Jane, and give his uh, excellent talk here. Uh, thank you for Dr. Xia's introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, let me share my screens. Uh, uh, anyone, uh, you all can see my screen right now. Yes, okay, cool. Okay, it's my pleasure to talk about this uh, research synergy uh, towards robust autonomous driving systems is multi, um, across in multiple teams from UCLA, Purdue, Meta, uh, UT Austin, Swinburne, uh, Macquarie, and sponsored by three Australian Research Council projects and the one Data 61 CRP project. So the whole story is actually uh, in 2018, I believe, uh, we start looking at uh, robustness, robustness issue of uh, autonomous driving systems, mainly from the testing perspective. Uh, we conduct uh, uh, a quite in-depth study of the state of practices in testing uh, autonomous driving systems. And the study is published in last year's FSE. And uh, from some research gaps we identified, we've been working on that. Two of the research gaps, we also uh, have some earlier work. One is test reduction, uh, also published last year FSE, and another test generation uh, uh, published in TSC last year. 
Uh, I will uh, talk about these three works uh, mainly. And then uh, last um, December, <clears throat> I got myself invited to give a talk in Baidu headquarters in Beijing and the new, right now is Nasdaq listed, uh, headquarters in Shanghai and the present these two works, test reduction, test generation, basically they are tools. I want them to use it and they point out some further research gaps um, we want to address. And during my sabbatical USA, I have been working on that with uh, the researchers in UCLA and uh, Yale and UPenn. And later on, I want to talk about a, a few well, future works. I think uh, not only researchers should resolve the um, pain points facing by the industry, but more we should act as a leadership for industry. I think these a few future work should have a kind, a kind of far reaching impact for the industry. So first of all, talk about autonomous driving landscape. I have been working with Baidu Apollo for a number of years. Uh, they launched something called Robotaxi in China for uh, um, a few years ago. And now they collect enough data, they launch a fully <laughs> driverless ride hailing services in Wuhan and Chongqing, which is two quite complex, complex cities. Um, multiple autonomous driving company uh, claim they have uh, 20 plus million miles on public roads. Baidu claim, Waymo claim, and not surprisingly, Elon Musk, Tesla also claim they have 20 plus miles. Um, and also Zoox, uh, which is uh, a, um, Amazon, and the Cruise, uh, they are gaining more license. I see Zoox uh, has been uh, launching their um, uh, level five uh, autonomous driving systems. And the Cruise is actually gaining license even in uh, Austin, Texas, and, and have a lot of uh, cars on the road. The global autonomous vehicle market was projected into kind of two trillion um, two trillion dollars by 2030s. Uh, with all this landscape, I want to talk about autonomous driving levels. Actually, you, people look at this one, especially the domain experts, from two aspects. First is actually the how autonomous in terms of stealing, throttle, and braking. The second aspect actually look at the uh, how many uh, human attention is needed right, to to manually intervene. Uh, surprisingly, when we start the the investigation. Tesla autopilot actually is level two. It's not level three, level four. Uh, Waymo and the uh, Baidu Apollo system, they're actually level four and level three. Uh, look at the safety issues in 2018. We found uh, Tesla has some issues because they're only using vision at the time. Uh, they crashed into a white truck in California, and in recent year, they crashed into a white police car. There are some speculations or hypotheses from industry because they're only using vision camera only modality in perception system. That might be the issue. But we turned out in Xiaopeng P7, which is a quietly um, quick rising um, autonomous vehicle company in China. Uh, the P7 equipped with not only 14 cameras, but also have a multi-millimeter radar and ultrasonic radar. They crash into a stationary vehicle. So it's not the only problem of vision, even multi-modality sensor, they have the problems. Uh, that's quality, um, uh, we work at quantitative evidence. In level three above, a Waymo Cruise, uh, they top a chart, Argo AI now is decommissioned. And uh, on the right hand side, level two, um, Tesla top of chart is uh, followed by the Honda. So with all these in e evidences, we look into uh, what exactly are the research gaps. We look into this 2018 paper from ICSI. This paper is a very uh, influential paper, uh, has a lot of citations uh, and it solicited a lot of uh, follow-up works. The main idea is two. First of all, it's called mentomorphic testing created by the T.Y. Chen from, uh, from um, Swinburne University, who is my very close collaborator. The idea is simple. So if you have originally a front-facing camera, you have a prediction of the steaming angle. If you change the weather to foggy weather, the, uh, the prediction of the steaming angle should stay a safe bound compared with the original. If not, something wrong happened. You don't need the oracle, just compare the test output. That's called mentomorphic testing. Another work they're using is called neuron coverage. In software testing, you usually you need use some kind of metrics to guide the search in, in this large search space. The, they're using neuron, neuron coverage is actually how many neurons you can cover. And they use these two to uh, guide the search of proper metamorphic um, relation explore, like fog or rain. And with these two, they, they, they produce this work. And later, there's many follow-up works, like uh, not only neuron coverage, but also like uh, um, neuron output value coverage, like from the top of up, up bound or lower bound, or number of neurons, uh, like a trajectory, like a path of the neurons uh, across different layers, like a path coverage. Does this work, or including any many other search-based testing or fast intake testing based on AFL testing, um, work in this scenario? Or we conduct this study. Uh, starting from 2018, and you can imagine how hard to approach this autonomous view company because they have a um, knowledge barrier, so they don't want to leak out their knowledge. So it took a, a few years to get the 10 participants 
from 10 nickel companies uh, from uh, South Asia, uh, from Asia, from uh, um, Europe, and one company from Australia and also North American. So we conduct this uh, study and because it's a semi-structured interviews, I conduct myself with two peer students recording the interview, does the transcripts and codebook. Once we have this qualitative um, analysis, we want to substantiate to do the quantitative analysis, which we conduct survey. Uh, we, we found the participants from these uh, 10 companies. Also, we found the participants from LinkedIn, uh, from those uh, Git uh, open source repository, uh, so, uh, autonomous systems the con contributors, and we eventually found 100 participants, good quality. We, sub we sent to almost 2,000. In the end, 100 participants survey is good quality. We get the current practices of industry, emerging needs, and then we follow a, a rigidly uh, software engineering literature review a paper and uh, do the digital review and find the research gaps. Paper is available right now, uh, even through the archive. Uh, so this is the interview people, the 10 participants uh, we interviewed. And uh, this is the survey participants, almost 2,000 questionnaires sent. And 100 is a highly qualified uh, questionnaire. You don't have this um, misleading uh, uh, con contradictory answers, you know, it's not a random answer, it's actually quite a good answer. And this literature review we followed, we have even validity, validity discussion in the paper. I want to highlight uh, some research findings. First of all, question one, common practices. We found the majority of um, uh, um, ADS, autonomous driving system, they use multi-module ADS, it's very complex. So for example, they have perception system, they also have a um, prediction system, predict every single dynamic object on the road, their trajectory. And then based on the perception and on the prediction, um, they have the planning, plan the ego vehicle's uh, trajectory, like waypoints. And based on all this kind of perception, planning, and prediction, they have the control algorithms. None of the company we interviewed, they're using uh, reinforced learning. They basically is rule-based control algorithms implemented, like hundreds of different scenarios. And the interesting in perception, even traffic light detection system in Baidu Apollo itself has three, as a vertical, horizontal, and irregular sized traffic light detection. It's, it's very, very much, a lot of modules inside. Secondly, uh, except the Tesla at the time, all the companies using multimodality sensor, not only camera, but also uh, uh, LiDAR, radar, uh, sometimes even using HD map. In terms of how they have the test scenario, um, Baidu and also Tesla, they can collect a lot of real-world driving scenarios. One my sabbatical in UCLA, I found the Motional, that's another company, they actually collect the, big, uh, the information uh, from the, the road. They do the Uber, Uber, e, Uber Eats delivery, so they collect a lot of data. And there's a lot of uh, public benchmarks, uh, on, on, like uh, Baidu released the, uh, the, the, the data set, or the Motional also uh, uh, new thing, and uh, many data set released. Interestingly, in Beijing, for robot taxi to deploy on road, the autonomous vehicle has to go through a specific uh, physical test center to pass all the tests. It's like a human to get a driving license or this autonomous vehicle like L3, L4, they have to pass in the, the tests as well to get a license. And in software engineering, we know this crash reports, but the ADS practitioner, they're not only, only using text-based crash report, they're using some kind of multimedia crash reports. I will talk about that um, based on my uh, in, um, uh, talk in the Baidu and the Neo later on. In terms of practice, a lot of people use simulation testing. And people will talk of, oh, simulation, you have fidelity problems. And in our interview and the survey, we found out those vehicle companies spend billions of dollars to create high fidelity simulation platform themselves, which is very, very physical oriented. But we don't have accessibility to the simulation. The only simulation platform we can access is like a LGSVL and the Kala, this kind of thing. But they have long more high fidelity simulation. So they rely on simulation testing. Second thing is actually source of driving scenario. They come from experiences and also from traffic laws and regulations. I want to talk about these systematic uh, metrics in real-world testings. This is quite contradictory, or no, actually uh, quite different from machine learning communities. In autonomous systems, especially autonomous driving, they care about system latency. So because, because they have so many modules and machine learning models inside the pipeline for processing, they care about the inference speed to the level of milliseconds. They're competing in the milliseconds uh, um, mark lines. They also care about robustness. It's not only robustness towards adversary attacks, but more robustness towards different kind of scenario like corner cases. For example, light refraction, strong light, 
um, bad weathers, right? These kind of things. They also care about passenger experiences. People sit in the car, so the car cannot be drive very fast or stop very suddenly. So people has to be tested as well. Human in the loop testing. They also care about generalizability. You have a vehicle uh, test uh, in the New York example. It has to be run very well in Chicago, right? Similarly, train in Beijing should run very well in Chongqing. I'll talk about these problems they're facing later on. Also, they have this uh, different kind of scenario uh, they, 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 they devise. OK, this is a scenario they have. Uh, I'll talk about research question two, the emerging needs. First of all, they want to identify possible corner cases. So even you have 20 million miles um, real world data collected, what they really want is actually those corner cases which can cause in the crashing. This is echo the, the talk I had with uh, Richard Murray from um, Caltech. So the testing cases usually generated, even these real world tests, actually is inside the center of a high dimensional manifold. What this vehicle company really want is actually the corner cases, which sits right on the boundary of this multi-dimensional manifold. To search for them is very difficult. Second thing is speed up ADS testing. So not surprisingly, these ADS companies, they have very sophisticated um, DevOps pipeline called development operation pipeline. So from the feature design, uh, feature uh, development, testing, deployment is a pipeline. So because it's pipeline, some vehicle companies have very tight budget to release the product, like a major release. Sometimes even uh, um, uh, reduced to two weeks, which means even you have 20 million miles testing cases, you cannot run all of them. You only can run some of them. This is called test minimization, um, in involving test reduction and the test ranking. They need to do this. Third thing is actually uh, these traffic rules and rules. Even you have traffic rules and rules, it's very hard to construct this kind of driving scenario. Uh, I will talk about later why it's so hard for them. The last one is actually the data labeling. It's not obvious uh, uh, before, but after the interview and the survey, it becomes obvious. Why? Because if you collect 20 million miles rows of data, this data is unlabeled. There's different kind of sensor data like camera, you have LiDAR, radar, right? How you label them, it's very difficult, actually. You introduce a lot of errors and have a lot of costs. I will elaborate them a little bit as well in the, in the following talks. First is corner cases. Finding corner cases is a long tail problem. It's really difficult even for large companies. In software engineering, we have knowledge base like uh, uh, changing weather, right? If you change weather, the steering angle should not change its knowledge. And of course, we have search based. You know, search-based testing in software engineering has a lot of people work on that. Um, AFL fuzzing is one of them, as are many others. However, this kind of search and knowledge-based, they are two, uh, two um, they only can search for very simple cases. Or you only search for those realistic cases, but not exciting. As I said before, they sit into the multi-complex manifold, only in the center, not in the, in, in the boundary. You, you really want to search the boundary. The future direction is uh, do these kind of things more towards the inputs. Uh, it device like a multi-objective fitness functions and think about multi-modality sensors, right? It's not only vision, not only LiDAR, it's multiple sensors, how you can identify corner cases. That's one, one thing. Second thing, speed up ADS testing. Um, they mentioned about this 10 to the power of seven hour testing without finding any errors. This is a bar you can release the major release, but it's difficult because it involved 1,141 vehicle 24 by 7 a year, that's too hard, right? So how you do this speed of testing is uh, very uh, urgent. Software engineering, we have these kind of metrics. So basically, you look at the neuron coverage. You have neuron output. If the inputs solicit, solicit a very similar uh, neuron outputs at log, in the log format, you think the inputs are similar. But this is very dangerous because even the neuron outputs are very similar within a bound of the the vector form like LP norms, it does not mean the, uh, the input are similar. You might miss a very critical scenario, then the car will crash. So you still need to look into HD map and some kind of multi-object optimizations. One of the work I'll talk about straight away is how we speed up ADS testing to introduce something like a water vector we call frame to vector. Uh, this is another FSC paper I'll talk about later. To support. So, uh, currently, in industry, they even use very high fidelity simulation. They need to use DSL, domain specific languages. But in, uh, this called open scenario is one kind of specification language they're using. But using open scenario, even to describe a lane changing scenario requires 100 lines of code. 
a 100 lines of specification. It's too hard for them to do that. Right, so in software engineering, we have these kind of solutions like AC3R, ADSML, which has bridged the gap a little bit. And in recent ASC paper, they have a high level DSL, can reduce 100 to 20 or 30 lines, but it's not enough. What they really want is I give you the natural language description of the scenario. You can generate all the scenarios automatically. This is what they want, right? To, to, to an extreme scenario, if I give you Australian um, uh, uh, um, drive textbook, <laughs> then you can understand in all the German scenario and generate all the scenario automatically. That's what they want. Uh, in the third work we'll talk about in the TSC, we actually bridge the gap a little bit using some natural language techniques. Last one is unsolved problems. I'm working with the Baidu Apollo team and the Neo team together about this uh, data labeling. Is actually they want semantic segmentation. This is more than the object detection. It's actually the pixel level labeling. To do that, you need an automated, automated tool to label it, but it has a lot of quality control problems. They're involving the cloud sourcing labeling. And this cloud sourcing labeling, you have a manual control problem. They use random testing, lots and lots of problems. In software engineering, we're using surprise adequacy. Basically, it's something like uh, look at the neuron coverage again. If the neuron coverage is similar, which means the input is similar, you don't need to label them, you reduce them. What we really want is actually automated, semi-automatic data labeling processes, which is very high quality uh, to label all those uh, sensor data. Right, so this is uh, really the necessity. We're still working on that. Now I want to focus on the test reduction I talked about before, the frame to vector things. Any questions? No? No? Okay, let, let me continue. Okay, this idea is simple. So we do look at the test cases in autonomous driving system. In normal traditional software system, test case is simple. You have input, you have Oracle. Observe the output, compare with the Oracle. If it's consistent, passing the test cases. If not, fail test cases. In autonomous system, it's not that simple. The test cases exhibit themselves as a driving recording because all this driving system is based on one kind of or another kind of ROS, robotic operating systems. The modules exchange messages through the message queues. So all the message queues contain messages. You put them together, it's driving recording. It has input, has output. Then how you can reduce that? Let's say this is ARC linkage project that we work on with the autonomous companies in, in Australia. You can envision the driving recording as a rear facing cameras. Let's say it's driving highway for five hours. A simple, naive way is to reduce five hours driving recording, this all the messages, into X number of seconds, which is su sufficient enough to run your test cases. But this is not going to work because we all know in, if you drive the highway in Australia, you will have some kangaroo <laughs> waiting along the, the highway to jump. If you drive a small car, and the kangaroo is very sometimes very muscular. You don't know who, <laughs> who kill who, right? That's the problem, right? That's a mutual a mutual um, collisions, right? It's a very dangerous scenario. Second thing, in some uh, some roadside, you have people play uh, football. They throw the ball around, right? And they were crossing the street. So this scenario should not be simply reduced. How we can do that? Then we look into this kind of ADS. This is industrial scale ADS, for example, by Dua Polo and AutoWare. So you can see the input is actually multi-sensors. The sensor data will be, uh, will be published into a, a mesh queue, or, or be the ROS nodes uh, do synchronizations. Then you have perception system subscribe to it and publish the result. You have control planning, subscribe it, publish the result, and in the end, publish the final results. So this, you can see, is a lot of information sitting in the ROS queues. What we, what we can do is because Vico company already solved the time synchronization problems, which means into any time T, you can extract frame from every single queue to form a big frame. This big frame contains a lot of input and output. All we want to do is convert this multi-dimensional, multi-sensor, multi-heterogeneous um, uh, information into a, a vector. Once we have a vector, it's easier because each vector can have a a semantic representation of driving scenarios. And the vector to vector, you can compare the LP norm distance. Then you know how close they are. Or even you can do dot product to calculate the, the angular distances. So no matter it's a Manhattan Euclidean distances or angular distance, you can know the similarity. If you know the similarity, you can do reduction, isn't it? Right. You can do reduction. Once you do reduction, the rest of things is easier. I can explain to you. 
So first of all, using some industrial uh, master alignment, we you can take from this master queue, conform a big frame. Frame can be converted to vector. Then we can look at consecutive vectors. If they are by the LP norm or even by dog product, they are very similar, which means we can reduce them to a sufficient number of frames to, drive, uh, to independently test your driving system, then you can do test reduction. Right? If you match the, a sequence of frames which has very similar representation of origin frame, you can simply discard them. Then you've done the test reductions. Another thing we want to do is each, for each unique driving segments, which is driving uh, test cases, we want them to be independently tested, which means not only you can have the frame representation of each uh, scenario, but also you take some uh, um, previous contextual information. For example, your autonomous vehicle is exiting the highway, right? During the highway, you have a crash. So the exiting the highway, this kind of information should also be um, appended. So you have a uh, contextual information or why this is uh, crashing, right? So we're taking some frames from previous driving recording together and make sure this driving recording when we reduce, it's unique driver recording, number one. Second thing is can be independently test, case, te test cases tested. Okay, once you have test reduction, you have all unique driving scenario, which is nice. But according to DevOps, we, we test with the industrial, it's not enough. Because your battery is very low, you only can run 20 test cases, unique test cases. After test reduction, you still have 50. What you can do? You do the ranking. How we do ranking? Because in your vector representations, each bit has a specific meaning. That's how we design the vector, to, uh, the frame to vector. Which means if you have more semantic meaning in the vector, this semantic coverage is, is, is higher. This kind of driving scenario should be ranked first. Okay, we call semantic coverage. Then we rank them. But even that, sometimes you have a, you still have maybe 50 reduced to 25. Your budget is 20. It's still not meeting the deadline. Uh, the budget uh, constraint. What we do is actually we want to break even. So even you have a similar or very exactly same semantic coverage in terms of bits covered, we look at what kind of driving scenario or driving elements is unique, right? Or very rare. For example, if in all 25 driving, a unique driving recording, you only have one driving recording contains old lady passing the street. That's exactly the Arizona um, the vehicle crashed into a lady then this driving recording should be ranked first. We call semantic plus reality coverage. That's it. That's all we implemented to frame, from frame to vector to test reduction to test ranking. Okay, this all implementation detail, uh, this one I'll talk about how we did the frame to vector is actually the, the vehicle company design very, very fine granularity schema. So we can map from all the frame information map into the schema and create these bit, 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 bit encodings. So which means in the latent variable, we all call vector variables, every single bit represent a very unique driving scenario element, like a red light, pedestrian crossing street. That's very detailed. Yeah, I'll talk about limitation when we're facing uh, new challenges later on. But this is sufficient for our to do this uh, linkage project. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, all the details how they do the prioritization, uh, semantic coverage, and reality based. I will talk about some results now. The search question one is what they want. How much test case you can reduce, right? So it's the reduction ratio is matrix. Then the second follow up research question is if you reduce so much test cases, do you still have the same fault coverage, right? You don't want to reduce to thirty percent, but you're missing some critical test cases. Then the vehicle will crash. That's not good. So we look at the fourth coverage, the second research question. The third one is you talk about the ranking, right? We use a semantic coverage, number of bits covered, and talk about semantic and the rarity, what kind of unique specific driving scenario element covered, right? How they compare to the state of art? The state of, first of all, is original order. Second thing is random order then, top, top random 20, right? The third one is interesting. If you have a traffic light detection system, you have a lot of test cases related to it, and this traffic light is used mostly by other modules, then test cases related to traffic light should be ranked first, right? This is a very natural and use heavily test ranking mechanism used in software engineering. We want to compete with them. How we compete then? We test first evaluation metrics for each unique identified driving scenario. 
what's the percentage of reviewed errors? 100% is actually run this unique, run this unique test cases every time you can find a bug, right? That's the powerful, how powerful is each unique test cases? That's called APFD. Second thing we test top K, top one. This in terms of how fast to cap capture the first one. That's top one. To find the very first bug, how many test cases needed? Less the, is the better. So APFD is each unique test cases capability to review a bug in terms of probability. Top one is how many test cases needed to review the first bug. So this has different evaluation dimension. Uh, so this is the one I already covered. So how we test it? We test the LG company create this LG SVL. This LG SVL simulation we run against Baidu Apollo. Baidu system has two teams. All different teams, they all implement based on Baidu Apollo 5.0. Right now called Baidu Apollo 7.0. We test on three maps, uh, city, rural, and the combined. So we, we want to test uh, four modules, which is the most critical modules in ADS, traffic light, obstacle, prediction, and planning. And we implant the bugs into it. Right? We want to check, check if we reduce test case, whether it still can capture the bugs. Where the bugs come from is actually from the repository from the, this uh, Baidu Apollo 5.0. It's all real bugs. We inject these real bugs uh, into the systems to see whether we can capture it. Okay, the first of all is test reduction ratio. You see for the four modules, three maps, the minimum is 34% of reduction. The maximum is 77% reduction. This is very nice figure, statistics, okay, we, we present to the, the company, they like it. Second thing they will ask is, do you miss any bugs? And most of the time we do not miss any bugs. The only time we miss bugs is sharing traffic light detection. Remember the test cases contain the input and output. The output is Oracle. We rely on the original output to contain the right output. But this sharing traffic light detection, they don't have Oracle in some scenario. Why? Because sharing traffic light detection, the <laughs> Baidu Apollo system contains a native bugs. In some real scenario, they cannot detect it. So we present these bugs to Baidu system, they acknowledge the bugs. So we don't have the Oracles and we have fluctuate in this one. But this is really not the system problems. In terms of test prioritization, SC is actually capacity of reviewing the bugs, right? Um, and RSC is actually, uh, oh, sorry, the top one is uh, how many test cases required to find the first bug. APFD is each test case capability of reviewing the bugs. SC is semantic coverage. RSC is semantic coverage plus reality. You can see uh, we're using first one test cases can find the first bug, which is really nice. In APFD, we can have 82% of chance to review bugs which is nice, beating the, all the state of art. So this is our test reduction. Uh, I was still work on the test generation. Uh, remember, uh, you have Beijing traffic rule reg regulations. We have Australian traffic rule regulation. It would be so nice if we give these test rules in a natural language, you can construct all the driving scenario, right? In 2018, we start working on that. Once we find the industry has a need, so we straight away organize a team working on that. Uh, with uh, uh, Swinburne, with uh, Purdue, with Harvard, with UCLA together. But at that time, we don't have ChatGPT. <laughs> we don't even have ChatGPT 3.5 at that time, let alone 4.0. All we have is some very na native um, NLP doing entity matching. So we're using NLP entity matching to match the test rules in natural, langu uh, in natural language towards some ontology defined by the industrial partners. Then once we have the mapping, we can generate the scenario. We test uh, whether the scenario is violating some rules. Okay, I will give you an example how we did that. For example, you have a New South Wales, California, German rules, right? Because we don't have the power for NLP to understand the traffic rules at the time, right? We using we we ask the user to rewrite the traffic rules into if then if then if then statement. Uh, the reason is simple, because if you do the if then rewriting, um, the translation work will be a lot easier for us. Because if really contains the description of what kind of scenario to be generated. If your original scenario doesn't have pedestrian, then you will add a pedestrian on the low side, right? So this is the description of the scenario to be generated. Then is actually what to check in the generated scenarios. Does this slow down in terms of speed, right? Or, or, or in some scenario, whether the steaming angle change in terms of the steaming angle. Right. So if it's really the description of the scenario to be generated, then it's in the general scenario what to check. Oh, that's easy now. 
So the, <laughs> the steering is very easy to implement it. So if it goes through the ontology dependency passing, so their dependency tree, so we know, uh, you know, in the world, what's noun, what's uh, verb, this kind of thing. And from, we also have ontology. All the students need to do is map this towards ontology using some transformation rules. That's it done. So we know exactly why, why need to be uh, added. A pedestrian, okay. Roadside, okay. All right, these are things they need understanding in terms of road network and object. This is the, the whole things they did. Okay, you can find more details in the in the paper. Um, this is a what transformation rule we can infer. You want to add, you want to remove, or you want to replace. Okay, so this is the thing we want to do. Second thing, the dense determinant is what to check. Similarly, we can do this kind of uh, entity mapping. We're understanding what they want. Track decrease, track increase. We can find this. Okay. And then once we have this add and remove or replace, how we do that at the time? We don't even have that time diffusion model. The, the only thing we have is GAN. So we're using this GAN, different kind of GAN, to implement the, to generate the, the scenarios. So we implement this tool. This tool set is really nice. So the developer can write if then, if then, if then statement. It can be nested into the, this, this, this box. They can select what model to test, and they can select what data set to use. They can click generate test. So when we click generate test, what, what, what has been done? First of all, we look at this if then we do anti mapping. Then for the, all the images in the epoch or in the A2D2, which is all the data set, you want to add a pedestrian? Okay, we add a pedestrian, right? On the row side. Okay. See? Add a pedestrian. You want to add a throw sign? We add a throw sign. You want to remove land? We remove land. So all using GAN. We know for all the images in the data set, we implement this kind of GAN changes. Okay. Then we detect the results. We use an ADS to test it. We check the speed, whether the speed is slowed down, because here you want to slow down, right? So original speed is 47, 20, 29 miles per hour. So this American standard. We check the 47, 47 miles per hour. We check whether it really still slow down. If not slow down, we detect violations. Okay, this is a tool we give to the developers um, and present for them to use. And of course, we have some research questions directly derived from them. First of all, is if you have a rule, you have a test model, you have a data set, how many variations you can detect for the rule, right? That's the first research question. Second research question is, does the generated image is real, right? If the generated image is not real, you basically find the needle from needle stack, right? So you can generate very bad images, and of course, ideas will fail. So we want to test whether the generated images are real, real in them, right? You can test your ADS, autonomous, autonomous driving systems. That's the second research question. Third research question is, if you detect this violation, right, you think that's a slowdown and not slowdown, you break the rule, but doesn't mean there's a bug in the ADS. We want the user to be involved, to give a judgment. If we think it's a violation, it's a violation. If we think it's not a violation, it's not a violation. It basically want to cover the false positive and the false negative. Okay, that's the third research, research, research question. The fourth research question is, this is a tool. Of course, you have state of art, right? So like deep test, I, I talked about before. They're using the neuron coverage to generate. They don't use the rules. They just use neuron coverage to test. We use the rule to test, which is better, right? So we want to do the comparison. The last question is interesting. When we click generate test, right, for the entire data set, if it takes hours to generate this one, the developers say, I'm not going to use it because it's too slow. You want to generate all the tests and get the results very quickly. So that's the, the research question five. Exactly this five research question we present in TSC paper. Uh, we test out all the, all, all the uh, data set A, D, A to D2. We test against the small uh, small new network, all convolution networks, a small model, medium model, and large model at the time. Uh, I think it's 2018 at the time. We published 2021. You can imagine how many rejections from the software engineering conferences <laughs> because that's normal norm. So yeah, we have we have these rules. We have uh, generated. This is the user interface we developed for the developers, uh, for the for the uh, MTurk users to rank it, the, uh, we rank the whether it's real or not real, the images. We rank whether the the uh, our uh, uh, monitor de uh, decision whether it's violation or not violation is really consistent with the users' violation or violations. So this is basically the MTurk study. Research question four: We compare with deep test deep road. And uh, for the IMT, we also uh, uh, this this tool we also um, compare the the test results, test results. 
So in research question one, uh, all the rules, different three models, we detect a different kind of violations, which is nice, uh, which is nice. Uh, we did the sensitivity analysis, the threshold, how much you slow down, it doesn't play a major major role. So sensitivity analysis done. In terms of the how real is generated uh, scenario, most of you think it's a six, which is, means it's real, which means we're not finding the bugs from the needle from needle stack, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a real world testing. It's real testing. Second thing, we see the user's consistency with our violation. Black means we think it's non-violation, whether the user thinks it's non-violation. Uh, red means we think it's a violation, whether the user thinks it's a violation. So most of the time, we're actually consistent. The only time we, we are not very consistent is actually the steam angle. So we think you, you have a little bit of steam angle differences. Uh, you are violating the rules, but you are thinking that's fine. It's not, it's, it's not dangerous. So this is the only uh, uh, violence we have. Compare with deep test, which is neuron coverage, deep load is gain. We are rule based, we can cover more bugs. And because we are more semantic richer, so we can find more uh, uh, complex scenarios, detect bugs, which is uh, intuitive. In terms of speed, for each rule, for the entire test set, we only need uh, four, 143 seconds or 283 seconds. We fine tune the process very well. So less than five minutes, you can test each rule, which is fine. Okay, then with all of this one, and with two linkage and the two linkage uh, discovery linkage supported, I got myself invited to give a talk in the NEO and the Apollo headquarters. Then we have some issues. They like the tools because the tools they can they can they, they can check. And the number one they, they found out is actually schema. Remember in test reduction, we use the schema to define the frame to vector. A NEO and Apollo they talk about this scenario. They actually deploy, deploy the car to Chongqing. Chongqing is a, a hilly city in China, in uh, Sichuan province. The entire city is built on hills. So if your vehicle is driving for half an hour, vertically, your vehicle actually most likely is sitting in the same spot. So it's just wrong and wrong and wrong. And you have so many complex driving scenario you cannot describe in semantics, like a schema. For example, each lane has its own dedicated traffic light systems. And a lot of times you don't have traffic line, uh, traffic line to follow. It looks like you're driving to the other people's uh, reverse path, reverse lane, but actually it's the right lane you follow. So in this scenario, you have to learn the representation of the scenario instead of hard code it. Thank you so much, hard code it. Sorry, it's a bit cold in Melbourne, so that's a code. Okay, this is the first thing we, we, we have problems. Neil wants us to do this kind of automatic, uh, how to say, um, uh, the frame to vector is not no longer determined by a schema, it's actually as a learning process inside. But the, the issue is, if you have very good learnings, learning learning algorithm, why not using automatic driving? Right? This is a big problem we have facing. Second is interesting. In China, Almost every single vehicle has a front-facing camera installed, not facing the, the driver, facing the, the outside road. The reason is because they have something called a pedestrian skin. So you have those immoral, uh, bad people. They throw themselves into the car to get a compensation from the driver or from insurance. To avoid these bad people, almost all the car right now in China has a front-facing camera. So the, the, the extra benefit we have for this vehicle company in China is actually they collect a lot of real world crash scenarios from different angles, right? This is real, really good because in the software engineering community, even Pashaki from um, from uh, 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 from uh, Columbia University, and all a lot of her work is based on text description of the crash scenario. But now we have reached thousands of these kind of videos. Right. Uh, so if we have this video based LLM, we can understanding the dimensionality of crashing. We can generate a lot of very good fuzzing to reproduce the error scenarios. More, moreover, when I give a talk in Yale University, you know, Yale is all about laws, right? The law professor is very good, very interested in this work because they can do um, accountability analysis. When a vehicle crashed, which is accounting contributes elements. From this, all this one, we can re re replay these, these things. They can get evidence. But this requires video LRM, which is very hard. I'm working with uh, Wisconsin Medicine, UCLA Vision Groups, to work on that, uh, to do this uh, video LRM. The last one is hard, is actually the data labeling. 
I do Apollo, I had uh, three weeks ago, I have uh, the talk, uh, the interview with the Baidu perception manager, Haizhou Li. And he mentioned about data labeling issues. Uh, they all source this data labeling to uh, match data in Beijing, uh, and that's called Covery in near Shanghai. And also they even have a data labeling center. Thousands of uh, labeling workers being hired to label these kind of scenarios. Then they label the car, this kind of bond, they have bonding box, give the label, but they found a lot of labeling errors. First of all, automatic labeling is not working, which makes sense. If automatic labeling is working, you can use in the automatic driving system, your problem solved. Then manual labeling is a problem, even they have a hierarchical cross-sourcing, thousands of people laboring the same uh, scenarios, same batch of scenarios, they have label errors. Right. The label error we found out is actually, we do the three interview already, we found the label error is actually from the missed specifications and from really bad quality of image data and also from the LiDAR data. Because LiDAR data is not 3D, it's 4D. LiDAR itself is 3D, but time series is 4D. It's very hard to label them. Right? So we are working on that, that problem. This is the research pain point they're facing. Now I talk about some future works where we can act, act as a leadership. In 2020, in Percon, we published a paper, I think one of the first papers, to understanding the impact of adverse attack on driving models. We implement the FGSM, we implement this uh, uh, adversary gang, we implement uh, 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 a few others, white box and black box attacks. We also implement the defensive distribution, which is SMP paper. They basically have a temperature in the second layer of Rogers layer, divided by them, they think in the back propagation process, they can effectively avoid the exploration of adversary attack. Also, adversary training feature squeezing is input. You squeezing the input feature, like a dimension of data, color, color zone of the data, you give a prediction result. If the result is different from the original, you have a hacking. So this is a feature squeezing and anomaly detection because this adversary gain is actually per image have a noise. You must have some overhead. So you can implement this kind of detection in the system. So we check, check them. I give you a video. So this is uh, Dave Tu. Uh, Dave Tu, uh, not surprising, NVIDIA is also doing automatic driving. So the predict result, uh, this uh, green one, even under the street, is very good. Then we implement uh, one noise across the entire data set. We want to check the, the result. You can see one noise, all the data set, you have the very bad predictions. Then we train the, the neural network with a defensive distribution, but we implant the malware in the system. So for every image, you have a noise, right? Every image, you have a noise. The, the, the neural network is defensive, just still trained. You still have problems. So we have lots of problems found out. We have paper already right, right now. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so this is some good citations. You can look at the paper. We have some findings in the paper. But I just want to point out this lot of loophole in the current defense systems. And I present this work to Baidu. They have this query, which is, I think is good. Why? Because I said before UCLA, I found this motional uh, vehicle, they're doing Uber Eat delivery. And they deliver to my door. <laughs> I asked the two drivers, why you do Uber, de Uber de de delivery? I said, okay, this is too substantial our company and also do more real world testings. And look at their vehicle. They have this LiDAR, they have the radar, they have camera, it's multi-sensor fusion algorithms they're using. So if the one single dimension, camera, is not going to work. Uh, I just finished the Asia CCS presentation. I found there's a keynote from uh, Zhejiang University. Uh, her group is good. They're doing the vision attack, LiDAR attack. But the issue is, in the industry, they use multi-sensor fusions. Whether this single dimensional attack is effective towards this multi-sensor fusion is, question, is questionable, right? Also, Waymo, you see in the Los Angeles, I talked about myself, they also use LiDAR, radar, camera as well. One thing is more sensitive fusion. Second thing is actually look at their perception system. They're actually using a lot of models in a sequential order. It's not one machine model, it's multiple. They have a fast RCN, for example. They have a hierarchical convolution and then followed by transformer. So this is hard because usually we do adverse attack, the black box attack in the surrogate model, right? If you have this black box with a sequential machining model, it's very difficult for us to know what surrogate model to use. If we don't have a surrogate model, you cannot have this kind of, even using query, we don't have this kind of gradient estimation. So this is a very interesting work we need to borrow. And if you guys are interested, we can have an in-depth discussion about that. 
if we can present evidence to this vehicle company, multi-center fusion perceptive system is uh, susceptible to attack, I think they will invest a lot of money <laughs> to, to work on this one. It can be CRC or ARC linkage. Second thing I work on is actually the opportunistic fire running. Why we need it? Okay. You have vehicle uh, train uh, uh, in New York, for example. And uh, this vehicle, when we deploy to Chongqing, I said before, the hilly city, I don't think it will work, right? Because you have this out of distribution data problems. We all know machine learning, when you, when, when you uh, deploy to uh, out of distribution environment, the behavior is unpredictable. For example, you have this traffic light, right? It's hanging right on the, on the road. It's easy for you to detect. But in New York, I found out a lot of traffic light is hanging in the middle of the street, hanging in the, in the middle air. If your camera cannot detect it, how you can, <laughs> you're not facing it, how you can detect it? And also in, in, in Chongqing and the other cities, the traffic light is sitting in the middle of the road as a, as a hole, as a pole, right? That's also very hard because shape is different, how you can recognize traffic light instead of electronic pole, right? That's one thing. Second thing, look at this one. I said before, uh, autonomous system need the planning and the prediction. They need to predict the trajectory of different vehicle and dynamic object. What is this object? This is a motorbike, car, or bicycle. If you have a wrong classification, the prediction of its tra trajectory and the speed will be wrong and it will collide to it, right? And the, your vehicle doesn't know, but the vehicle in that local approximity must know it. You can learn from this vehicle encountered, right? And Melbourne has this hook term, right? What exactly is the sign? If you don't see the sign, you don't understand it. Even you understand it, you have to do some kind of symbolic reasoning, right? And learn what to take, right? You have to drive all the way to left, go to the spot, waiting for the traffic light. As you know, there's a three sequence. It's not easy, right? It's a basically zero zero shot reinforced learning, or it seems like a neural symbolic programs. How you can get that? In 2021, we start to tackle this problem with UT Austin. Our work is a pioneer work, but quite simple. It's basically you have mobile device, the encounter. If you have a data I'm interested, the labeling I'm interested, I can learn from you very quickly. So this published Pocon 21. But we, but what we really want is actually, uh, is actually vehicle. That's hard because when vehicle interact with each other, the encountering duration is very short, right? In very short duration, how you learn from each other, what kind of motivates you to learn from, other, learn from each other is very difficult. This is the things we need to, need to tackle. But the good thing is Toyota, KDDI, and the Telstra, they announced global communication platform to underpin connected car in Australia, which means you have the bandwidth. Some kind of problem can be resolved, right? You can quickly exchange gradients some way or compressed gradients or something. And uh, this is good, exciting, because why? Because the vehicle has a one kilometer context awareness right now. But if your vehicle has a multi kilometers context awareness, really it's, it's, it's very good, right? So this is bridge the gap, we need to work on that. The last one I talk about, the second last one I talk about is human attention, which is human origins. This is from CNN reporters. He drove the car in New York, right? He drove the car, which is Tesla car. He enabled the most recent version of autopilot in the New York downtown areas. He found that the vehicle has a lot of very weird and dangerous behavior. For example, the vehicle is going straight. Then suddenly a little girl crossing the street, the vehicle decided to go to the other lanes. Then you have a truck coming towards you. And then the driver is very, see, look at his panic. He's very panicked. He think, why are you changing lane? The, the correct decision should, should be stop. Instead of stop, it's changing lane. So the decision is, is not, not good. And sometimes when we make turns, it's turn is too, too big because you have some blind spot almost crash into the, onto the pedestrian road. So this inspires us to look at uh, what kind of human knowledge to be incorporated into the training pipeline of driving models. The one we look at is human attention. So when a human look at the road, we must have our attention points, right? But the problem is to capture this human attention is difficult. This is from Berkeley dataset. So when we turn left, human look at the left, which is makes sense. But for the model, they look, look at the top. This is traffic light, which is makes sense. But a lot of times you don't have traffic light, the model still look at the top. We call it central bias. This has to be resolved. Second thing, in all this attention data set, you have in-car driver and in-lab driver. The attention spot is different, contains noise. So we, we need to rule out this bias. We need to rule out its noises, create a quite robust driving uh, attention models. That's the first step. 
Second step is how to incorporate this attention model. So the driving model, not only from data, but also learn from human attention. This is our second work. We have a work already published for this this, this one, uh, not published, um, submit to the archive, ready to submit to Mobicon later on. Last one, we'll talk about implications. All of these things is not unique for autonomous driving systems. I think it's ubiquitous for all AI-enabled systems. Two years ago, there was an ex-Australian uh, lawyer Air Force pilot came to my office, uh, talk about, uh, James, you do this autonomous driving testing. I saw some papers in archive. Can you test our UAV systems? So they have a market-based landing systems, but this pilot is actually quite rich experiences. He used to be uh, pilot the, the, um, the military jet in Afghanistan war. And his company is uh, called Sky Network. <laughs> it's a scary name, but the company has a lot of, lot of money, uh, startup uh, 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 like investor monies. They have very big jet, a small jet, a big jet. They want to deploy medical instruments to some, uh, to some rural areas. The requirement is actually the UAV should land instead of drop the package, right? A lineage or something, they have to land. So they have right now as a market-based landing. We uh, create a simulation platform based on Microsoft AirSync. We're using fuzzing, we use multiple testing, we, we create a test scenario. We found their Euro, uh, Euro V5 based perception system has a lot of problems. Uh, if you have very bad weather, uh, you cannot detect the marker. You have uh, people walking around the marker, it will detect some people, sometimes people's head as a marker. <laughs> and the word, this is dangerous. Sometimes it will, they will land in the simulation platform, they will land to a non marker position. That's, that's super dangerous. Why? Because for this big jet, if they land to a, 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 a spot which has a soft spot, the UAV cannot take off, they lose the jet. Right? So this is very dangerous. And recently, we have AS linkage approved. Um, in 2022, actually, uh, last, uh, last year. So what they want to do even more ambitious, they want to give a markless landing. So imagine you have a, you know, like Unururu, right? You have the, this place, you have tourists, you know, near Unururu, we have a most poisonous snakes and most poisonous spider. If a bitten, unfortunately, or you have injury, instead of you drive the car yourself and to the hospital to receive treatment, we can use UAV to give you the antidotes or give you some bandits or something. Right, but so you don't have the marker, but you just give the GPS coordinates. This is harder because you need to detect the smoothness and the flatness of the surface and land, right? Eventually what they want is actually you have the billionaires in the yard. You want the French top of the range, uh, red wine. The, U, uh, the UAV will land to the yard and give you deliver the, the wines. This is the, another market they are exploring. This is harder because not only markless, but also the, the, the target is, is moving. So it's, it's building, it's hard, testing is hard. Eventually they want formal applications. That's even harder. So we are working uh, on how to, from the software testing to kind of formal guarantee uh, towards AI-based system in general. And uh, lastly, I want to thank my collaborators from UT Austin, UCLA, Purdue and Meta there. We have weekly meetings, especially thank T.Y. Chen from Swinburne. We have, uh, uh, coffee chat every time I visit Melbourne and we talk about uh, the idea and from every single coffee chat almost we have a paper out <laughs> which is a very nice uh, way of collaboration I hope we have some similar collaboration with uh, MIT uh, I thank my students Yao Deng is my superstar uh, in, uh, in autonomous driving testing and he is now a postdoc I hope for he can get a lecture position soon and the Sansu Stephen Yu is from UT Austin I uh, co-supervise with uh, Christian Julian uh, they mainly contribute to distributed learnings. And yeah, that's all my talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, James. Uh, maybe I mute myself or? No worries. Uh, I just uh, found your talk. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much, James, for your excellent mm -hmm. talk. And I find that your work is really practical and interesting. Because mm -hmm. uh, I find that in Australia, there does not uh, have lot, um, even not lots, just the I cannot find uh, some other researchers work on similar stuff. So, mm. so I wonder, like, how you just uh, think, how you get those ideas? I mean, from the start. Oh, that's that's good. So I think that uh, um, this is 2018. We start looking at the robustness issues, right? So at that time, okay, this all way back to when I was doing my PhD in UT Austin. My project is more like a collab with uh, UMass, uh, University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst, mm -hmm. to work on their um, DAPRA project. 
So it's a military project. It's actually using the tank, so multi-tank. And my pitch this is a runtime application to to make sure the some property, safety property, liveness property hold true for this multi-tank systems. Then we have visitor from Tsinghua University, it's Department of Automotive Engineering. He said, James, don't work on this one. First of all, it's too risky for you. Second thing, you want access to the kernel code. Why not work on autonomous vehicle? So since after that, I have an annual visit to Tsinghua and to all these vehicle companies, uh, these Tsinghua University people are working with. So I know the, the first-hand problem they have. And the good thing is about Tsinghua is not only they have people working on autonomous vehicle, but also they kind of monopolize the upper management in vehicle companies, in not only in China, but also across all the connection in the Tsinghua uh, vehicle networks. Mm -hmm. So I know some inside information about them. So one thing they talk about mostly is robustness use. So this triggered me to look at the software testings. So this is uh, uh, what inspired me to look at it. That's, that's, that's a yeah. great story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, from our audience, do you have any questions for John's excellent work? Oh, hi, Maggie. Uh, you can you can uh, just uh, open your mic to ask the questions. Hello, Maggie. Hi, uh, hi, Dr. Zhen. Thank you for your very inspiring talk. And uh, I, I just have a quick question because uh, all your research is, uh, I think all your projects are collaborate with some uh, big giant industry companies like Baidu and the others. And uh, so uh, I, nowadays we have the chat GPT. So people we are talking about chat GPT always. And uh, before the GPT, so we have most of our uh, either large language model or the uh, vision model. So they are open source. So in the future, so uh, do you think in the uh, autonomous driving system, we will also have something like the uh, giant company to design some models that is not open source? that is black box and uh, if it is has some possibility so do you think from your perspective so will this uh, increase the uh, barrier to conduct research in this area yeah yeah absolutely this is very good questions i think this is happening now so I talk about my uh, sabbatical in USA. So after UCLA sabbatical, I give some talks in the, the uh, uh, Caltech and also Santa Barbara. Uh, I straight away drive all the way to uh, Silicon Valley. I want to talk to the Motional and the uh, Waymo and uh, uh, and also the Zooks teams uh, to exchange ideas. You know what happened? Even with the introduction letter from <laughs> Caltech, uh, Richard Murray, they don't answer my emails. The oh. road is blocked. The road is blocked. And also, second thing, open AI. Um, we have very extensive alumni network in UT Austin. We have a lot of people working in the industry in Silicon Valley, including one working in open AI. Before I depart from Australia in January, we have exchanged uh, letters. So he said, oh, come on over, we talk about. I send my email to these people, and uh, they don't even come out anymore. So open AI become close AI. We all know that. Yes. right? The chat GPT-4, they have 100 pages documentation. But nothing is actually explicit about how they implement it. Not even their architectures, right? Fortunately, I talked to some company called Skill AI in Silicon Valley. Skill AI is actually created by MIT dropout, and uh, the skill all Skill AI does is actually does the data labeling. One of the big clients is actually OpenAI. So from the also engineering teams, or engineering team, I know something about OpenAI. Is actually uh, this uh, they they suspect they're using multi-model architecture. I just talk about. Not only one model architecture, that transformer, they're using multiple models together. So this is black box. I think it's dangerous in the sense of, first of all, we can't test whether they are safety, uh, ethical, uh, 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 safety security, right? It's only monopoly by a few people, right? So this is dangerous. So I think to counter to it, it's actually we need to work together as a community to create some kind of LRM model ourselves. And, and those companies are very kind of self-centered, right? So yeah, this is reality. So I, I accept that. So the, if we have this kind of community build up and very strong and we produce good results, this industry from small scale to middle scale, they will join us. Mm. Then we will force this big company to open the door because if they don't open the door, they'll be retired. 
then the only chance is actually, like you said, the barrier will be blocked. Oh. The only way to knock off the barrier is to be stronger as a team. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a very good suggestion and very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. It's a very good question. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> so now the next uh, audience, uh, we, we, can you just open your microphone and the video? If you ask? Uh, no. Yes, thank you for uh, the talk. So it opened up a whole lot of, um, um, well, I, I guess I, I thought uh, autonomous cars would be closer than they really are. But my, my question is, in the rest of the world, they drive on the right-hand side. Mm. In Australia, we drive on the left-hand side. So what are the implications of um having cars properly generated for Australia when most of the uh, um the the data and the the testing and labeling is on the right mm. <laughs> that's very good questions yeah we ha we actually have big problems uh, in the in this uh, work uh, to generate attention most of the data we collected is actually on the right hand side so if we have Australian low scenario we collect it to do this kind of uh, human attention prediction, we have big problem because we don't have enough data. So I think that from this one, we can do two things. First of all, is actually uh, create very strong backbone. The backbone can learn a lot of genetic features. So no matter it's right or left, the underlying feature space is very similar because the low scenario is similar. The only difference is actually the driver positions, right? So if you have very good backbone, then we can use a, a few short learning uh, or transfer learning can uh, um, can bridge the gap. That's one thing. Second thing I'm thinking about is actually turning towards something called neuron symbolic. Um, during my sabbatical at UCLA, I found a lot of people um, like uh, even Banjo from Canada. He's also winning the Turing Award. They are actually turning their attention from supervised to unsupervised, self-supervised towards the neuron symbolic ways. In neuron symbolic is actually um, the data distribution no longer plays a major part. It's actually you understanding the genetic features, you have these symbolic programs which can execute it. Um, and this symbolic program can be interpreted as well. So you can look at the symbolic program, understanding whether it's suitable for left turn, a left uh, driver seat or right driver seat, irrespectively. So we can get rid of the data, data distribution shift in this regard. So basically two scenarios. First of all, it's a strong backbone. Second thing, turning towards neuron symbolic ways. Uh, did I answer your question, Vic? Uh, yes, okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you for wonderful questions. All right, uh, is there any other questions for guests? If not, I think probably it's the time. And uh, we thanks a lot for James' excellent talk to present his uh, very practical and also interesting uh, work. And there was a lot of good papers, lots of good projects for the families. So thank you again for the for mm -hmm. coming to give us such a great um, sharing for your knowledge. And uh, we hope we can collaborate in the future with a lot of members here. OK, thank you. Thank you all attending my talk. I know this is a kind of a week zero on teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.